Good evening, good afternoon, or even good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to our webinar, 5G, an undeniable risk, presented by 5G Alert Westchester. I'm Doug Wood. I'm the founder and national director of Americans for Responsible Technology, and I'm delighted to be here with you tonight. I see many friends here, including friends from Westchester County here in New York and from other cities and towns across the country. Thank you all for being here. I also want to welcome our local legislators, other elected officials and board members who are joining us this evening. We very much appreciate your public service and your interest in this issue. We're here tonight in a spirit of common interest and mutual goals, as we seek ways to safely integrate new technologies into our communities. The phrase inflection point gets tossed around a lot these days, but it's certainly true in this case, as more and more communities find themselves confronted by wireless technology companies wanting to provide services to customers and residents who want to have control over the proliferation of antennas and to protect themselves and their families from any possible harm. I think we can do both. We can have technology and we can have safety. We just have to figure out the best way to do that. And that's what we'll be talking about tonight. There is a large and growing body of science showing that chronic exposure to RF radiation from wireless antennas and other devices can have serious biological impacts. And we'll hear tonight from experts who can tell us more about what the science is showing. We'll talk a bit about the rapidly increasing population of people who are sensitive to RF radiation and how microwave sickness has upended their lives. We'll hear why 5G technology may not be the gateway to the future that tech companies envisioned, but instead a fading technology that never quite achieved its promise. We'll hear about how the wireless industry has been less than forthcoming about the safety of its technology, how the FCC's safety limits for exposure are more than 25 years old and completely out of date, and we'll hear what some states have done to address this issue. We'll end up this evening with a presentation about municipal codes and how local governments can and should take full advantage of the powers granted to them by Congress in the 1996 telecommunications law. Anyone who tells you that their hands are tied by the FCC either doesn't understand the law or has some other reason for opposing strong protective codes for their constituents. Before we hear from our presenters, a bit of housekeeping. We're going to let our presenters make their presentations, and then we'll be doing the Q&A. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat, or there should be a Q&A button where you can uh, put your questions in. We'll get to as many as we can. Uh, for those who've been asking this question, yes, we will be recording this event. It will be available tomorrow, and all of you who registered will get a notice of its availability as soon as it's available. Our first presenter this evening is Dr. Paul Heru, a scientist with experience in physics, engineering, and the health sciences. He is currently occupational health director at McGill University's Faculty of Medicine, where he teaches toxicology as well as health effects of electromagnetism. Both electric utilities and telecommunications companies have retained Paul as a consultant on biological effects of electromagnetic radiation, and he is a member of the International Commission on the Biological Effects of Electromagnetic Fields. Please help me welcome Dr. Paul Heru. Good evening. So 5G, an undeniable risk. So the first thing that I want to show you this evening is essentially what industry has been telling us about this radiation for a very long time. So this is the Cellular Telephone Industry Association telling you that there is no convincing scientific evidence that the weak RF signals from base stations or cell towers and wireless networks cause adverse health effects. So my comment on this is that industry will never be convinced and always deny any health impacts of radio frequencies. The industry is this cut never really changes. They have two arguments. It's non-ionizing, and it's too weak. So let's first look at this argument of non-ionizing. 
This is the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before. This here is the ionizing radiation. And we know that this radiation at those frequencies, gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet, have the property of stripping electrons from atoms. But this particular property has very little meaning in that part of the spectrum. So what is the safety associated with this radiation that is at different frequencies? Well, biology would tell you that what we are adapted to as a species is the radiation that has been on the earth for a very long time. That means the radiation from the sun, which is this range here, as well at extremely low frequencies, the static field of the earth. Anything that is completely artificial has to be viewed with a great deal of suspicion. So essentially, Artificial, completely new radiation cannot be labeled, you know, uh, fleetingly as inoffensive. The other argument is that this radiation is too weak. And here I have a diagram that shows you at the very top a line that describes the limit promoted by the FCC. They're telling you this radiation is safe. As you go down this diagram in factors of 10 of power frequency, you go to vanishingly small amounts of radiation. All of these red dots are observations by individual scientists who have measured in their labs or in their experiments health effects or biological effects of electromagnetic radiation. So the question is, can all of these people be wrong? and the FCC be right. In other words, are these non-thermal non observations to be disregarded? So on, only using heat to assess health risks is completely incompatible with the evidence that you see there. And at the physics point of view, it's because atoms, electrons, and protons interact differently with radio frequency radiation. So these standards that are so high by the FCC are based on heat. And this decision was reached about, oh, more than 50 years ago, actually, at a conference in 1960 where people compared notes, the US Air Force, General Electric, Bell Laboratories, and the Soviets were using quite different levels that they thought were safe for radio frequency exposures. So how could all of these people be wrong or right? Ultimately, the standard that you have in the United States is very close to the standard that was promoted by the US Air Force. And this standard was ultimately uh, confirmed by the IEEE, by the uh, engineering community. But in 1966, when it was sort of set in stone, you have to look at the committee that voted on this particular high level based on heat. Most of the people involved were from the armed forces. Petroleum Institute, Space Administration, General Dynamics, US Treasury, and one from the Public Health Service. This reflects the fact that in 1966, most users of wireless were military. And the military, although they knew that there was something inherently dangerous about this radiation, said very plainly, people get hurt all the time in the service. And so they were willing to accept these risks. A little bit later on, these limits were confirmed by the Institute of Electro Electrical and Electronics Engineers using experiments on monkeys conducted by the US Navy by the Lord in 1984. And you will be disappointed to realize how thin and superficial these experiments were. They consisted of five monkeys that were irradiated for 40 minutes in three separate sessions at intensities so high that facial burns were produced on three of the five monkeys. What they measured 
was the RF heat necessary for hungry monkeys to stop demanding food. So this was used as a landmark to produce a reference standard. So the FCC limits intended to protect you from RF are based on heating effects that are meaningless in terms of the long-term effects of the RF radiation. And by this, of course, I mean a lifetime exposure to this radiation. So as a consequence of these high standards, we have experienced a number of health impacts associated with exposure to this radiation. In this short presentation, I cannot go into all the details uh, of these health effects that would be complicated. I just want to dwell a little bit on one item, which is carcinogenicity, which is a problem that is heavily focused on in our society because we know it's lethal, we know it's serious, and so on. So if you look at the file on cancer, you can see that, in a sense, you don't have to trust the advice of any one human. The collected experiments that we have on cancer constitute a pool of 4,288 rats and 2,180 mice that tell us from the assessment of tumors that they experience that there is clear evidence of carcinogenicity. This comes from Chu Ripacholi Lurchel, more recently from the National Toxicology Program in the United States and the Ramazzini Institute in Italy. So these limits were apparently inappropriate, but I have diagrammed here the limits of the FCC. And this is, of course, increasing amounts of exposure. And you can see that this bar is very, very long. And I point out here the experiment on the monkeys that was used to generate this tolerance, apparent tolerance of humans with a safety factor. So this is what the FCC believes that you should be tolerant to. More research, recent standards of a variety of organizations have a very different opinion because as you can see, each one of these divisions represents a factor of 10 in the radiation level. So clearly, if you consider the new world that these standards are referring to, which is the world in which everyone has a cell phone, uses them regularly, and is chronically exposed to the network of cell towers, the clientele of wireless has changed entirely over these periods. And of course, the committees here are not the military. The committees are public health people. They are physicians and they are scientists. So they have a different opinion divided both by their, their constituents of their committees and by the more than 50 years that divide them. So I also want to mention the fact that there is a big contrast in terms of human exposures whether we use uh, telecommunication systems based on optical fiber as opposed to wireless. Of course, optical fiber is, doesn't give you mobility, but optical fiber is incredibly powerful in terms of the data rates that can be obtained. And it is extremely effective in terms of energy transmission. Of course, it's also entirely unhackable. It has many other qualities. But what we should retain is that optical fiber in technological terms is the superior way of transmitting data. Wireless is a convenience to give you mobility, and it should be used only when mobility is needed. So finally, I want to say a few words on uh, the... Uh, 5G and Internet of Things. Uh, obviously, those things are great to expand the semiconductor market. This is why industry is pushing them so hard. And also, they're pushing uh, wireless hard because they realize that optical fiber will be perceived very soon by the community as infinitely superior. 
So wireless is an inferior choice te technologically because it would increase exposures to RF. The new 5G radiation would be more intense and impulsive because of decreased penetration depth, beam forming, and multiple input, multiple output. It would have health impacts not only in electrosensitive people, but in rates of cancer, diabetes, fertility, and neurological diseases. So wireless is bad for global warming as it is energy inefficient, and it is bad for privacy because radiation can be hacked very, very easily. And I hope I haven't gone too long. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you, Paul. That was really very excellent. And you have such a charming voice, I must say, a, a great delivery. And it's fun to listen to you speak. Um, our next uh, presenter is Dr. Kent Chamberlain, Professor Emeritus and past chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of New Hampshire. Dr. Chamberlain is joining us today to tell us about a state commission he served on that explored the health and environmental impacts of microwave radiation, which include the effects of 5G. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kent Chamberlain. Yeah, thank you, Doug. Yeah. I should also note that uh, Professor Iru also served on the commission that I'm about to talk about. So there's going to be a little bit of overlap between what we had to have to say. Yeah, I served on the commission and we ex that explored the health and environmental impacts of cell phone radiation. I'll give you a brief overview of our findings in the next few minutes. One important thing you should know at the beginning is that while there are clearly identified health risks associated with cell phone radiation, there are also many approaches that can be taken to minimize exposure and protect against them. So with appropriate action, we can continue to enjoy our cell phones and do more, do so safely. The first step towards achieving it is simply to acknowledge those risks. I also wanna say that I'm doing this free of charge, giving this presentation free of charge, uh, because I'm not sure how many volunteers there are out there to spread the word about the concerns and the risks about wireless radiation. Doug, so Doug, I, I thank you for your efforts. So what I'd like to do is just get into my slides right now. So I'll bring them up and let's hope that they come up correctly. I hope you see them, Doug. Uh, can you verify that I've got them? We do. Thank you. Fantastic. Looks great. So shown on this, this slide, the commission I served on was convened through bipartisan legislation and was created in order to answer questions about the effects of microwave radiation exposure. And that includes all generations of cell phones. The legislators were being told by the telecommunications industry that such radiation exposure was completely harmless. Well, some of the legislators' constituents were reporting that the exposure was causing harm. There's also the scientific evidence showing harm, so the legislators decided that the best way to find out the truth was to form an independent commission. Uh, legislation which formed that commission, and by the way, I should note that the slides will be made available to everyone on the show, or everybody watching, all the listeners, and you can click on the link shown if you want to see, for example, what the legislation I'm talking about looked like. So the uh, legislation that formed the commission was passed by both houses of the legislature and it was signed by the governor. And it was pretty clear in describing the questions to be answered and the expertise needed to answer them. So also seen on the slide are the people that ended up serving on the commission. We had people with expertise in medicine, physics, uh, two, two physicians, uh, toxicology, electromagnetics, et cetera. And I was asked to serve because of my background in radio frequency and biomedical engineering. And none of us were paid for our participation and none of us were affiliated with the telecommunications industry, except for those members who were brought in to represent that industry. I mean, after all, we needed to have their input in order to make a fair and balanced adjustment, a judgment. So a natural place to start an investigation such as the one we were tasked to carry out is by a thorough review of the scientific literature. And frankly, I, I must admit that at the beginning, I was skeptical and I didn't think there'd be very much to find about harm from low level microwave radiation. 
after all the long held conventional wisdom for those of us working in the field of radio frequency engineering is that exposures to low level fields is relatively harmless. However, it didn't take very long to discover that many art articles documenting even low level exposure being harmful uh, and that uh, long term exposure definitely pose risks. Uh, one claim you may have heard from people affiliated with the telecommunications industry is that the only articles showing harm from low-level microwave radiation exposure are those from fringe journals. Now, I'm familiar with low-quality journals, which is what I assume they mean by fringe, but as a former associate editor for a major scientific journal and as the former chair of a high-tech academic department, I'm familiar with ways to determine the quality of a journal. In particular, the quality of a journal can be easily assessed by such metrics as the credentials of the editors, the editorial review board, the reviewers, the H index, and the acceptance rate. And all of this information can be found online. And using these metrics, I can state that the New Hampshire Commission used information from high quality publications to formulate its conclusions. Another claim made by the uh, telecommunications industry is that journal papers showing harm from microwave radiation are what they call cherry-picked. The suggestion is that most studies do not show harm and that only the few that do show harm are presented as evidence. Fortunately, this claim can be easily tested by analyzing the findings of papers from credible journals to determine whether they do or do not show harm. Such an analysis was performed by Dr. Henry Lai at the University of Washington, and that analysis, linked here, shows that over 90% of the papers reviewed show oxidative stress as a result of microwave radiation exposure. So a summary of the last two bullet, bulleted items is that there are many publications in high quality journals that show harm from microwave radiation exposure, and that such publications are not in the minority. Indeed, they are in the majority. Given this, if anyone tells you that low level microwave radiation is harmless, they are either woefully misinformed or putting it politely, they are not being truthful with you. After all, there is a lot of money to be made by installing new wireless facilities in your city. Since one of the uh, major uh, harm causing effects of radiation exposure is oxidative stress, I'll say a few words about it. That stress can lead to the creation of free radicals. Studies show that cell mitochondria are affected by even low level radiation exposure, causing free radicals to form during the production of ATP. I suspect that many of you are already familiar with the concept of free radicals, along with ways to lessen their impact on your body. You may know that free radicals lead to chronic illness, including the ones listed on the slides, such as Alzheimer's disease and, and diabetes. And you probably know that these illnesses have increased significantly since the rollout of wireless communications in the United States. Now, many of us try to head off the effects of free radicals by eating the right foods and by taking the right supplements, but I'm not aware of any study that shows that diet and or supplements can counter the effects of microwave radiation. During the time that the commission went, met, we brought in recognized experts in the fields relating to microwave radiation and health. And it's worth noting that of the nine experts we brought in, only one of them claimed that microwave radiation is harmless. And that was the one expert brought in by the telecommunications industry. That expert was the only one paid to present to the commission. All of the other experts, the ones who weren't paid, were, weren't paid for it, reported harm from microwave radiation. Now, here's something that uh, you've already heard about. And that is from Dr. Iru, and that is about the you know how the limits were set. We've got a link here that shows uh, how to uh, access that information. But as Dr. Iru pointed out, very short-term studies were done. This was back in the 1980s. Uh, exposed animals, food-deprived animals, to radiation until they couldn't do a simple task, and that's what they set as being the upper radiation limit. And then they divided that by a factor of 50, and they said, well, that's okay for the population in general. So this is something the commission looked into. And it's obvious that a study performed in an hour cannot assess the effects of long-term exposure, such as what we're exposed to 24 seven. 
Uh, it's like having a group of people smoke a pack of cigarettes each and then proclaiming that cigarettes are safe, harmless, if they all survive. So these radiation limits are, are ridiculously outdated. We did try to get the FCC to come to one of our meetings to answer questions, but they never did. We made similar requests to other lettered agencies such as the FDA and EPA, but they never came either. A reason some government agencies are not responsive to the public can be explained by the fact that they are captured. Uh, the case of the FCC being captured is explained in the Harvard University report live, uh, that's linked right here. It's good reading and it provides an explanation as to why microwave radiation limits have not been changed in more than 26 years, even though those limits have been successfully challenged in court. The reason that industry wants to keep these limits high is that it would cost a lot to comply with more reasonable and safer limits. Our commission submitted its final report back in November 2020, two years ago, my gosh. And you can access it through the link provided. You don't need to read the entire 390 pages as the report is, uh, most of the report is in the appendices, but you can get the gist of our findings in the first 17 pages or so. Some of us who served on the commission are now working to write legislation to carry out some of the 15 recommendations made by the commission. I'll say a bit about it in a little bit. Uh, while most or many municipalities have enacted meaningful protective ordinances against microwave radiation, we've tried to enact ordinances at the state level here in New Hampshire. Our original legislation, HB 1644, linked here, included a 500 meter or a 1,640 foot setback for new wireless facilities, along with a registry for, for the reporting of microwave radiation sickness. Information relating to a setback distance that the commission recommended are linked in the slide. The first link is a meta study which combines the findings of 38 epidemiological studies of people living near cell towers, and the second one describes the rationale used by the New Hampshire Commission. Although the major components of our bill were gutted as a result of the legislative process that is going through the committees and subcommittee, we ended up with a positive 15 to 3 endorsement to do something protective with regards to microwave radiation exposure. The committee simply felt that the setback and the registry wouldn't pass in the full legislature. So what we are working on now are bills to educate people about radiation exposure and to provide state level guidance to help municipalities write their own wireless ordinances. An important bottom line here is that legislators got the message that microwave radiation poses a serious threat, health risk and that something needs to be done about it. We are currently working on this, so please stay tuned. So final, what to, I'll leave you with, and I hope I'm not taking too much long here, is that a formal state commission of unbiased experts formed through bipartisan legislation concluded that low-level microwave radiation is harmful to human health and the environment. It also identified technological developments that should be pursued to lessen exposure limits and make the use of our tech, this technology safer. It's a, a change such as migration to fiber, which I think you'll hear about from a number of us tonight and you heard from Dr. Iru. So move to uh, wireless uh, or wired connections. That's a good start. And kind of my plea here, as somebody who's been doing this for free for a while, is that if you're in a position to do so, you, you I strongly encourage you, and the commission strongly encourages you, you to enact protections against microwave radiation, which includes halting the rollout of 5G in its present form. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. That was very, very interesting and very helpful. Um, I want to take a minute. We now have 222 people on this call, which is really great. Um, by the way, before I leave, Ken, I just wanted to say thank you for your service on that New Hampshire committee. It has really had a big impact. And Dr. Iru also, he was on the commission as well. Thank you to both he of you. He had farther gentlemen. to go to get there. For the, <laughs> we, we, we really appreciate your service on that on that committee and the work that you did. It's had a really a big and very positive impact on the whole effort here. I wanted to welcome those who uh, have joined us late. Uh, I'm Doug from Doug Wood from Americans for Responsible Technology. I'm the uh, I'm moderating tonight. 
Um, and I just want to make it clear that those of you who join late have not necessarily missed the thing because it's going to be uh, it's being recorded and it will be available to you tomorrow. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Sharon Goldberg. She's an integrative internal medicine physician based in Santa Fe, New Mexico, associate professor of medicine at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. She's an expert in the diagnosis and treatment of EMF associated illness and was course director for the 2021 Electromagnetic Fields Medical Conference. Please help me welcome Dr. Sharon Goldberg. And Thank you, Doug, for Bye. that great introduction. Let me just share my screen. Give me a second. Sorry, so taking a second. I see a lot of patients with uh, with EMF associated illness in my office. So I was asked to speak to you tonight about the health effects of microwave radiation. So if there's only one thing that you remember from my talk tonight, it's, it's this slide. And really what, what I hope you take away from this is that when people think about the effects of microwave radiation, particularly cell tower cell phones, they immediately think about EHS. They think about electromagnetic hypersensitivity. They think about tinfoil hat people, sensitivity, this, that. It is true that this is a real entity and EHS is a bona fide clinical diagnosis. There are many people that, that are living with EHS. But what is more important for you to understand that really this is, this is much larger than EHS. And if you look at this iceberg diagram, um, many of all of these conditions that you can see under the water, these are all conditions that are exacerbated by exposure to microwave, uh, to microwaves. So for instance, from cell towers. So, so really uh, wireless and microwave exposure, it is not just about EHS, it affects all of us. Um, our families, uh, even our pets. So this is what, what I'd like you to remember. So what we often hear from, from the telecom industry is that microwave exposure is safe, but this is completely false. And there are several facts on the ground that just uh, completely disprove any claim about the safety of microwave exposure. So the first fact is that uh, we in the medical profession, we have uh, clinical practice guidelines that were published in 2015 for the treatment, for diagnosis and treatment of, uh, of EMF related health problems and illness. So it's not possible for the wireless industry to say that, that people are not being harmed. So many people have been harmed that they had to write a clinical practice guideline and you can see it here. Uh, the second fact on the ground is that we've had two medical conferences for physicians that are educating physicians, again, on the prevention, diagnosis of treatment and treatment of EMF associated illness. The most recent one was in January of 2021. And this conference actually is still available for any healthcare practitioners who would like to get continuing medical education credits uh, while studying about the, the health effects and harms of, of EMF exposure, they can, you can still register for this conference and get, uh, and get CME credit. Uh, and this is just to explain that putting together a medical conference, it isn't something that you can just throw together. It's a very, reg it, it's, a, it's a complicated process where you have to submit all of the slides, all of the materials are, are vetted by a third party organization to prove that it is truly evidence-based. So everything that's being taught to physicians about harms from EMF is, is evidence-based medicine. So the third fact on the ground is something that Dr. Chamberlain already, already mentioned, and he talked about uh, oxidative stress. And what we know is that radio frequency radiation, i.e. the cell tower radiation, uh, it causes oxidative stress. So what I'd like to explain is just a bit about what oxidative stress means clinically. So what it means is that all of these horrible chronic diseases that many of, many of us, many of our family members are dealing with are, are exacerbated by exposure to microwave radiation. And this includes cardiovascular disease, like heart attacks, neurodegenerative diseases, like Alzheimer's dementia, multiple sclerosis, autoimmunity, and even diabetes, which people don't often connect with microwaves. So I've put in a couple of extra slides and my presentation is gonna be available afterwards so people can read, but a microwave radiation is not the only cause of oxidative stress. There are many other things that can cause it, including, uh, including chemicals and ionizing radiation. I'm gonna skip this one. 
And now I want to sh uh, just shift gears and show you a couple of papers. So um, to just to sort of show you that that really the connection between radio frequency radiation exposure and these health issues, it's it truly is see it, it is in the it's it's evidence based. This isn't just something that we're making up. So here you can see a, a paper showing that cardiovascular showing the link between cardiovascular disease that we need to start um, identifying other environmental risk factors such as uh, such as radio frequency radiation. This is because of oxidative stress. Uh, here's another paper explaining how oxidative stress is the shared mechanism between many different types of neuropsychiatric illnesses, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, depression, schizophrenia. Um, now, diabetes, the connection between microwave radiation and diabetes is, has been, this has been known for, for many, many decades, and this is from the 1970s. You can see that, you know, that since the, they've known in the, and they knew in the 70s that there were links between increase in blood glu glucose and other markers that are, are connected to diabetes. And here's another paper showing that oxidative stress is part of the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. Another one, Wi-Fi. I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna fly over these. I'm gonna, as you can see, there's there's no lack of these studies. And here is one um, one paper showing that there um, that there is there was significant impairment in motor screening task, basically cognitive function in students who were uh, who were who were tested in a high RF area. They were close to uh, a cell antenna. Uh, one more thing I want to mention about about radio frequency radiation is that it's well known, uh, it's it's well established that it causes reproductive harm and damage to sperm. But another thing that really is less well discussed is uh, is the problem with endocrine disruption that it interferes with uh, with secondary sexual development and with hormones. This is something that really needs to be looked into further. And last but not least. Uh, Microwave radiation has, has real effects on microbes. And I have an entire lecture on this. The link is going to be at the end of my talk in case anyone is interested. This was from the 2021 EMF Medical Conference. But the bottom line is that, is that microwave exposure in bacteria can cause antibiotic resistance in many of our, of our key human pathogens. And it can also cause antibiotic-like effects in our good bacteria, like in our gut flora. So this is this is a real problem, and I've thrown in a couple of these these bacteria studies for the sake of time. I'm just going to skip over this. But the bottom line is that the the conclusion of, the, of these papers was that uh, that radio frequency radiation exposure is a real problem uh, in the world of infectious diseases and complications of infectious diseases. Here you can see again. This is this is I'll close with this is a paper. Uh, showing millimeter wave exposure, looking at the effects on lactobacillus acidophilus. And yes, this is the same organism that you know people will take as probiotics. It's what we find in yogurt. People are taking it for gut health. But the conclusion of this study was that after the lacto lactobacillus, after they were exposed to 51.8 and 53 gigahertz for one hour, they saw strong antibacterial effects on lactobacillus acidophilus. In other words, it was being killed in the same way as if they would have administered ceftazidime, a cephalosporin antibiotic to, to these bacteria. So this is a problem because this is, part of our, this is part of our gut flora and we want our gut flora to stay healthy. So my takeaway messages. Um, so number one, RF EMF exposure, it's scientifically proven to cause harm in all life forms, not just humans. Oxidative stress is a key mechanism of harm. Um, and that we have, as I mentioned, many facts on the ground to show that, that this harm is real. We have clinical practice guidelines that physicians use to treat EMF-associated illness. And we've had two major medical conferences so far providing CME credits for physicians to participate and learn about those harms. So these biological effects are scientific facts. They are not fiction. And I hope that you will consider seriously this request for the setbacks and protective uh, ordinances that are being requested. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. That was really, really great. And, and may I say thank you for being a medical professional who can confirm what so many people know 
uh, from personal experience that this is not their imagination. This is real. Um, and your your video testimony that's been on YouTube for a while has uh, inspired a lot of people. And we're very, very happy to have you with us tonight. And thank you for that. Oh, that thank really, you. That was great. Let me just make clear what we're talking about here is small cell antennas and and larger towers that are being put in front of people's homes. Um, I, I think it's important for everybody to understand this is not some remote idea. Uh, depending on the code that's in your town, and uh, we'll talk about codes in a little while, but depending on the code that's in your town, one of these antennas may go, uh, may go up in your front yard. Uh, and at that point, it's really too late to do anything about it. So it's really critical that you understand that the health problems that we're talking about have a direct, can have a direct impact and may have a direct impact on you and your family in the place that you live. So that's why we're so concerned about this. That's really why we're having this uh, program tonight is because of that fact that we're experiencing what we call involuntary exposure where you don't have a choice. The antenna is gonna go up near your property. It's gonna be on 24 seven, 365, whether you use it or not. Um, and you know, one of the things that we stress at Americans for Responsible Technology is this, we're crossing a threshold into in, involuntary exposure that we think really deserves some very, very careful scrutiny from government agencies. So. Um, maybe we'll talk about that in another webinar, but I just wanted to make clear, this is not some abstract idea. This is something that's happening right now in communities across the country. There were thousands of small cell antennas put up today, and there'll be thousands more tomorrow, and on and on it goes. So it's never too early to get busy, to organize yourself and your community, to uh, put up a little a little defense, shall we say, football term, um, and make sure that um, that your community is as well prepared for this as they can be. Excuse me. <clears throat> I want to turn now to Mr. Frank Clegg. Frank Clegg has spent his 40-year career in the technology industry, retiring as the president of Microsoft Canada in 2005. Frank became concerned about the health effects from radiation emitted by wireless devices and their supporting infrastructure after extensive research, and he co-founded Canadians for Safe Technology in 2012. Please help me welcome Frank Clegg. Oh, thank you, Doug. Are, are, my, are my slides? Uh, yes, they are. We're good. Yep. Great. Terrific. So I want to, uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us for yet another Zoom meeting on your calendar, which I'm sure everybody's really enjoying these days. Um, Doug, I just, I just want to, before I get into my presentation, I want to build on, on what you said about the, the, the antennas and the towers. I think it's very important that people understand the density that 5G is going to demand and require from an industry perspective. We have seen modeling and talked to industry people offline where in densely residential areas, we could see a small cell antenna every hundred yards in that area. So this is not something that's going to be the way we see cell towers now, where you have a three or 4G tower that may be a kilometer down the road. The amount of data that's being driven, the amount of data that's being demanded, particularly in video applications, every 100 yards will be the design point to provide the service level that is expected with 5G. And as Dr. Haru talked about with the internet of things, that's where device, where uh, semiconductors and devices are talking to each other without any human intervention. So that's why I want to talk about uh, the opportunity to have, instead of having that demand for that data being driven and provided by wireless technology, the majority of those applications can be fed and provided with a safer, more secure um, uh, fiber connection. So um, as you had mentioned, uh, Doug, in, your, in my introduction, so thank you for those comments. Um, I have spent my entire career in the technology sector. Um, most recently, I retired as the president of Microsoft Canada. 
Um, Doug, as you mentioned, I spent my entire career in the technology sector. And so, as you can imagine, I've seen the tremendous benefits that technology can provide. I've also seen the potential harm if technology is not implemented correctly. And I, my, uh, having re reviewed uh, the scientific evidence, the fact-based uh, uh, data that's available, my conclusion is that our implementation of wireless technology is not safe, and I'm particularly concerned about its impact on children. That's why I helped co-found Canadians for Safe Technology in 2012. Uh, we focus on raising awareness about the potential harmful effects of wireless technology and also uh, challenging and encouraging government to improve legislation. I joined the Environmental Health Trust led by Dr. Deborah Davis uh, several years ago uh, to continue uh, ex um, sharing information about how to use technology more safely. Uh, we do fund some uh, significant research I will uh, point out, I know Doug, at the end, you're gonna talk about uh, certainly your website. I wanna just put a, a plug in for the environmentaltrust.org on our website, where it's internationally based. So anything that you wanna know about the most current um, study, science-based evidence, we're trying to make that available on our site, but also anything going on on a worldwide basis about 5G, community efforts, government legislation is on our, our website as well. I wanna focus on wireless technology and, and wired, uh, particularly fiber. Um, one thing you'll note, and, and Dr. Hu touched on this very briefly, there is no motivation for the technology industry or the telecommunications industry to explore a wired solution. All the current technology products are, are, are drive wireless and require you to upgrade to a wireless device. And the only thing that's going to drive profits and, and growth in businesses which executives are paid to, to, uh, to provide is through wireless devices. Similarly, in the telecommunications industry, they are all about getting you to buy bigger data plans, more and more data, and that only comes from a wireless environment. And so as executives are compensated, measured, and rewarded on quarterly profits, they are not going to spend the energy and the effort to look at wired solutions. So therefore, it's up to us um, as citizens and us as legislators to look at these uh, opportunities and, and challenge the industry to, to take a look at these wired solutions. I'll give you some facts that uh, a wired solution consumes up to 10 times less energy than its wireless equivalent. Wired solutions are 100 times faster and as the technology evolves, they will continue to be significantly faster than any wireless equivalent. Um, wired technology is uh, more reliable and more resilient. Whether you're running that fiber cable across the land network or in, on the bottom of the ocean, you put it down once and you leave it there and it, it lasts uh, for decades. Whereas you constantly see 3G towers being replaced by 4G towers. And now with the 5G implementation, the 4G towers are going to be uh, left there, but then they're going to be complemented with all these mini cells that we talked about um, earlier. Um, there's uh, two, two reference documents. Uh, the first is by Dr. Zuboff out of uh, Harvard University. Uh, very extensive analysis. Uh, I think it's close to a thousand pages. Probably one of the most enlightening, um, frightening uh, books that I've, I've read in, in my career. And Dr. Zuboff gets into very specific details about how we're not being protected. When you, when you click on a, uh, a terms and conditions of, of any kind of an application, uh, particularly a wireless one, uh, you're actually unleashing about, in some cases, dozens and dozens of pages of terms and conditions that allow many, many players that you're not even aware of to collect and store private and secure information. Um, the, because of the wireless, and Dr. Haru mentioned this very briefly, because of the wireless environment, you are open, the points of vulnerability are significantly higher in layman's terms, it can be hacked a lot more easily because it's not buried in the, in, in the ground or under the ocean. And there's significant risk of personal and business data in a wireless environment that is a lot more contained in a wired environment. Some of you may be aware of the privacy project by the New York Times, I think it was uh, two, two um, reporters there, where they were able to get a hold of uh, one file from one third party uh, provider that had over 50 billion location pings, which is a, a point where a, 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 a cell phone was, was uh, recorded, over 12 million Americans in different cities in the US. And so if you happen to have a medical condition that you don't want people to know about, 
I would argue that that is available to certain people today. If you are in a certain social environment that you don't want people to know about, if you're part of the military that you don't want people to know about, any private personal information that you are, uh, wish or don't want people to know about, I would argue in today's environment by accessing just standard cell phone using applications that you normally use without setting all your privacy uh, points significantly higher than we normally do, someone can find that information. And not only that, can sell that information or use that information to market and, and uh, to, to, uh, to other people who may uh, want to use that to, to sell you something or may in fact want to use that in a, um, a, a more um, harmful way. Um, continuing in the, in the wired versus wireless environment, um, a 5G base station, uh, this is by the IEEE, so the International Engineering, Electrical Engineering Organization. A uh, 5G base station is expected to consume three times as much power as a 4G station. Uh, there's a significant movement among scientists who track uh, data on weather forecasting data that are starting to become concerned as we drop all of these satellites in space now to support this 5G infrastructure. So not only do we need to have these small cell antennas potentially uh, every 100 yards in your community, but we also need to have a significant ring of satellite devices that are significantly lower in orbit than the satellites that we're used to. And the pollution from these satellites, uh, the experts are predicting could, uh, could result in as much as a 30% reduction in weather forecast accuracy. So our ability to predict hurricanes as we're in the hurricane season down in, uh, on the, on the south and along the east coast of the US or the tsunami season in other parts of the world are gonna be significantly reduced in our ability to warn people to help prepare, uh, to avert, uh, some, not to avert, but to avoid any damage to our personal property. Um, just to give you an idea on the size and the magnitude of this, of this um, energy, if the cloud was a country, it would be the fifth largest consumer of energy in the world, number five and it is growing faster than any other industry in the world uh, today. Um, there's another concern that's just starting to be raised is as the technology companies are going out and locking in energy uh, providers, and a lot of that energy is being provided by our local hydro municipalities, whether it's at the state level or the county level, they're locking in because a lot of the, um, the counties and, and states now may have a surplus of energy. And so the technology providers, whether it's telecommunications or technology providers are locking in these energies at current rates. And as we start to see not only the, the demand from the technology energy, but as we get into more uh, electronic vehicles, there's a significant concern that we as taxpayers are going to have to make up the difference between our local communi community or our local government's commitment to these rates of today's to today's levels to what the demand is going to be in the future and that which will drive higher prices. I wanna just also talk about Dr. Uh, Timothy Shockley out of the University of Colorado uh, has done an extensive amount of work over the last many, many years, a, a, a paper that he's written, Reinventing Wires, that talks about um, and this in his theory that he's proves in this in this very extensive document that if the telecommunication companies had started from day one and laid down fiber, instead of putting in these cell towers and antennas, it would be significantly um, uh, more reliable service and a significantly uh, less, uh, less costly service. The challenge, as I mentioned before, is, and, and I was an executive, I know this, you are measured by next your current quarter results. And once you have a good quarter, then you are measured on the next quarter results. So it's very, very difficult for an executive in an organization who's measured on a quarterly return basis to make a long-term commitment to a fiber or a cable infrastructure that may take many, many years to, to pay off. Yes, it is cheaper in the long-term, but is definitely not cheaper in the, in the short-term. So that's why Dr. Shockley talks about uh, publicly owned and publicly funded. And he references in his, um, in his, in his uh, publication uh, two uh, constituencies, one in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and one in Longmont, Colorado, that talk about how the local uh, community uh, and, and, municipal, and municipal government 
made the investment. As you can see in, in the case of Chattanooga, a $220 million investment had yielded over $860 million uh, return in economic growth. In Longmont, Colorado, because of the local investment that was made by the municipal, uh, municipal government, uh, they can provide inexpensive at less than $50 a month, one gigabyte service. And as Dr. Haru talked about, that service can be made available because the technology is already in place. So there's nothing to stop the citizens of Longmont from getting you know, two gigabytes for 50 bucks a month because the infrastructure is already in place. Um, I want to return to uh, another uh, project in Canada. Again, I give you these examples because a lot of the times we hear, well, fiber is difficult to lay. It's difficult to work with. Wireless is so easy. Well, here are municipalities and organizations that have made the decision to go with a fiber network because it is, in fact, cheap in the long run. And, and the best example I can give is up on the western coast of, of Canada and British Columbia, going up the western coast. It's a combination of, of fiber that's being laid in the ocean floor and along that rugged coastline uh, to serve and, and provide services to 139 rural communities uh, around the, uh, in that part of Canada. And as you can see, the project is about a third complete and they've laid over a thousand kilometers of fiber optic uh, cable to date. Okay, I'm over time. I wanna just end on one more business discussion and, and Doug, I'm sorry, I hope I can do this, but I'm gonna do it anyways. Uh, financial considerations. Um, what we're seeing is the reinsurers. So these are the insurers that the telecommunication companies go to for insurance. And they are now officially writing white papers and publishing white papers that are saying, we are concerned that the health effects and the damage claims from health effects to the, to the telecommunications companies are going to be significant. And you'll notice for, in 2019, Swiss Re even came out and said, they're starting to raise concern about the costs of hacking these wireless infrastructure networks. So I'll end on that and I apologize for going a couple of minutes over. Uh, I got excited and I, and I apologize, but I hope, uh, hope you found it worthwhile and I look forward to, uh, to a Q&A. No problem, Frank, we're happy to have you here. Thank you for, uh, for, you, for that presentation. Um, you have to learn how to spell fiber, of course, but that's, you know, <laughs> that's the way it is. You're, you know, your perspective as a business insider is really, really helpful for us to understand how the industry thinks about this. And thank you for your work with uh, Canadians for Safe Technology and Environmental Health Trust, two great organizations we're happy to be associated with. Our next speaker is Andrew Campanelli. He may not need it. Uh, good need afternoon. He doesn't good need evening, Don. to me. Hi. Um, uh, good evening. My name is Andrew Campanelli. For those of you who don't know me, um, <clears throat> I've been a litigation attorney for about 26 years. I've handled cell tower cases and actions on the Telecommunications Act since it was actually adopted back in 1996. Um, I like to think of myself as being on the front line of the 5G rollout because I am. I handle cases all across the country every day dealing with the 5G rollout. The majority of the 5G rollout is actually not being carried out by wireless carriers like Verizon or AT&T. Uh, the majority of the rollout is being carried out by site developers. These are companies that don't actually provide personal wireless services. Um, they build wireless infrastructure and lease space on their infrastructure, the carriers. Uh, they also tend to be the ones who are the most aggressive. And most often when I receive a call from someone who says, they're trying to put a cell tower on my front lawn or five feet from a bedroom window or right in front of my front door. It's usually a site development company. Contrary to what local governments are being told across the country, the biggest impediment to their ability to regulate these things is local governments failure to draft local ordinances, which give them the power, number one, to control the placement of wireless facilities and number two, to exercise that power in a, mean, in a manner which complies with the requirements of the Telecommunications Act. Every time I hear someone say, oh, our hands are tied by the Telecommunications Act, that tells me the person has absolutely no idea what they were talking about. When Congress had acted the, the Telecommunications Act of 1996, it actually considered giving the FCC the power to control where wireless facilities go. At the end of the day, it did pretty much the opposite. Entitled a provision C7A, which is entitled General Authority, and within which Congress preserved to state and local governments the general authority to regulate the placement of wireless facilities. That hasn't changed since 1996. Armed with the powers preserved them by Congress, sophisticated local governments have drafted local ordinances 
to achieve three objectives. Number one, they're called smart planning provisions. They're designed to enable carriers to saturate your town, county, or village with wireless coverage. While number two, minimizing the number of wireless facilities you provide to need to provide that coverage, whether it's a cell tower, small cell, or distributed antenna system. And number three, avoid to the greatest extent possible any unnecessary adverse impacts against um, residential communities and individual homes caused by the irresponsible placement of wireless facilities. To take grasp of the powers preserved to them by Congress, local governments have to draft well-conceived local wireless ordinances, which both give them the power to regulate these things. And number two, ensure that when their local boards decide cell tower applications, they comply with the procedural requirements of the Telecommunications Act. Far too often, local boards are thrown to the wolves because your local zoning court code does not give them guidance with regard to the procedural requirements of the TCA, and local towns cannot expect their planning board, planning commission, or zoning board of appeals to comply with procedural regulations imposed upon them when they have no idea they exist. Now, I've drafted local codes for local governments across the entire United States, and I, for, for quite some time, I've just been bewildered by the absolute weak ordinances drafted by local governments. And I would say, could it really be that municipal attorneys are really that incompetent, that they just don't know what they're doing? And it wasn't until fairly recently that I realized it's not entirely their fault. And what I recognized is this. Some town will have a municipal attorney who's very good at what he does. He handles employment law or she handles employment law during the day. And the town says, hey, can you draft us a wireless ordinance where we impose a requirement that if somebody wants to build a cell tower or a small cell or a distributed antenna system, they have, to give, they, give us a, they have to get a permit and they have to go before our planning board. And so the local attorney will spend an hour or two researching the Telecommunications Act and they figure, okay, I got this down. And what they go back and tell their local government is, you know, your hands are really tied by the Telecommunications Act. Every federal case I look up is a case where the municipality got sued because they turned down an application and they lost. What the local municipal attorney is absolutely clueless to is that they're only looking in the cases where the municipality lost because the cases within which the municipality properly exercised their power and they did so in a manner which complied with the TCA, there is no federal court case because once the application was denied, the applicant didn't file a federal lawsuit because they knew they couldn't win. So they may be finding one out of every 20 cases that an application was turned down those being the only cases where the applicant thought they had a chance to sue and win, and so they did. So the biggest problem by far is not the Telecommunications Act. The Telecommunications Act preserved broad authority to local governments to regulate the placement of wireless facilities, how many there are and where they go. The biggest thing preventing local governments from doing so is adopting a well-drafted ordinance, which gives them the, which enables them to grasp hold of the power that's been given to them by Congress. So the good news is local governments are contacting me all over the country. I'm starting to get these things done. My standard ordinance runs about 47 pages single space um, and it provides guidelines. It also arms local zoning officials and zoning boards like the planning board to be prepared to receive applications where the applicant submits false and materially misleading information. Everything from false FCC compliance reports to misleading visual impact analysis, even false appraisal reports. Um, I've seen most of the games they play in 90% of the applications being submitted uh, by, uh, uh, by site developers these days. I see them submit false information. My ordinances empower them to take care of that stuff and address those issues. The other major danger to local governments are the hoodwink laws. The wireless industry is growing big money around at state legislatures to adopt hoodwink laws. What are hoodwink laws? Well, to the extent that the wireless industry has been unable to get the FCC to strip even more powers from local governments, and they've tried to do so and they've had some success, they've been going to state legislatures to adopt state laws to strip local governments of the power to prevent the irresponsible wireless placement of wireless facilities. Um, these laws are drafted to be deceptive. They are inherently deceptive and they trick state legislators to st into stripping far more power from local governments that they intended to. You look for buzzwords in these hoodwink laws saying things like small wireless facilities, rights of way, and co-location. Um, they will approach the state legislatures and tell them, look, we just want a law to regulate uh, these little boxes they're going to put on existing utility poles. 
on main roads. These hoodwink laws are directly responsible for wireless facilities showing up on people's front lawns, um, boxes on their front lawns, five feet outside of bedroom windows, because they are taking advantage of the fact that the state representatives have no idea what they're, what they're passing. Um, for example, when they talk about saying that, okay, this state law only applies to facilities being placed in rights of way, public rights of way, but they define public rights of way to include public utility easements or utility easements, and they consider themselves being the site developers as public utilities, which they've used now to claim as a public utility, the state law allows them to use a utility easement to put a wireless facility on someone's private property without their permission, without paying them. So the biggest dangers to local governments and the citizens they represent are one, their failure to adopt a well-drafted ordinance, and two, their state being coerced and deceived into adopting a hoodwink law which strips almost all powers of local governments to prevent the irresponsible placement of wireless facilities. So with that, I'd like to open up for questions. I find that to be beneficial. Um, I, I, I have yet to find a question somebody could ask me about the Lawrence cell towers that I wasn't able to answer. So thanks for your time. And I hope people ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. You cut me off before I could tell people that you were licensed to, to appear before the Supreme Court and, 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 uh, you know, and in appeals courts and in district federal courts across the country. Very impressive what you've done. The whole community owes you a big thank you for what you've done. I will mention that uh, a number of your codes, as well as um, uh, some other things that we have on our toolkit at Americans for Responsible Technology, and I'll just share that for a second so that you can see um, the Advocates Toolkit. We have um, both the smart planning provisions and the sample and the code checklist are things that people might be interested in. Those will answer a lot of the questions that are coming in about, you know, do you have any uh, sample codes and so on and so on. We've got several codes up here, some of which were written by Mr. Campanelli um, and others which we think are, you know, also have merit. So I just wanted to let you know get that. Again, it's on our website, which is americansforresponsibletech.org forward slash toolkit. It's right there. Doug, if I could just chime in for a moment, I saw yeah, your sure. list. And yes, uh, yes, I've been admitted, admitted to the United States Supreme Court since 1998. There are 13 United States Circuit Courts of Appeals. I think I'm admitted to nine out of 13. I've been admitted to federal courts in something like 23 states. I saw on your list that you do have some codes, for example, Langley, Washington, Fishkill, New York, uh, Woodstock, New York. I did draft those codes. Just one word of caution. I draft these codes on a municipal by municipal basis. Uh, there is no one thing, a thing is a template code that you can use across the country. When I draft a code for a specific municipality, the first thing I look at is the uh, current case law from the federal circuit court decisions in that circuit. So the code that I drafted for Langley, Washington is different than what I would draft for someone in New York. I also take into account each specific jurisdiction's zoning districts, topography, uh, population density, um, uh, scenic resources, aesthetic resources. So these things are custom tailored to each specific municipality, again, to adequately address their needs and to make sure that what I draft is consistent with the federal law of that circuit, which makes it as immune from challenge as possible. I wanna make sure that if I help a municipality, and they decide to turn down an application for a wireless facility, the likelihood of getting sued to challenge that denial is reduced as much as possible and make it even more so that if they do get sued, they would ever lose. So I just, I can't just say, you know, you know, take my code from Langley. Uh, they're different. I draft different codes for different regions of the country, but I and, appreciate that. Thank you. Andrew, I was going to say that, but you said it way better than I, Sorry. Than I can. Sorry, so thank you for that. I had an interesting question come in for the scientists. Are there any definitive studies on 5G? We have lots of studies about 2G, 3G, 4G. Have there been any good studies yet on 5G? If not, why not? Anybody? Paul? Because it is too new in the sense that to assess the health impacts of any kind of deployed technology, you have to use uh, animal experiments. You have to use uh, studies on humans. And so the delay in truly assessing the health impacts can be 20 years, 30 years sometimes. I mean, you know that the human cancer can have a 
a, a latency uh, of 30 years and research has a com comparable latency. You can't develop research uh, at warp speed because animals don't reproduce at warp speed. Cells don't divide at warp speed and university professors don't work at warp, warp <laughs> speed. <laughs> <laughs> that's the perfect answer. Of course, that's very convenient for the telecoms because they can say, well, show me the studies that 5G is harmful. Oh, you don't have any studies? Oh, well, then I guess it must be fine. At one point, I was I, I was a consultant for Northern Telecom, which is now defunct. One, I think the most precious, I, I told them two, two uh, I gave them two precious things. I gave them the idea that a cell phone should squawk all the time so that it could know its location. They didn't know that at the time because I, I was an airplane pilot. So I, I know that was a convenient way to do things. But the second thing is I told them, you can change your, your, your techniques of telecommunications much faster than the health community can assess them. So you can always be the front runner claiming that, that this and that has no health impact. And so uh, I'm also interested very much in what Frank said about the fact that managers are paid, are, uh, you know, are sort of recomp uh, recompensé on the basis of how much more they can sell than the past quarter. I wonder if there's any serious sociological study being done about things that only insiders of the industry know very well, but that could have a lot of impact on our society generally. Hmm. Anybody want to take that on? I had a question, and it can't. Maybe you can, or, or Paul. What about the millimeter uh, wave studies that were completed by the military and by Russia? Are those helpful for us, or not? For me, all of the studies that I've seen at the higher frequencies just raise a red flag. I mean, you don't move forward with a technology whose risks you don't understand. Uh, at the higher frequencies, you're, you're, you're getting into some area where uh, existing equations don't seem to define accurately what's going on. Paul, you might, and I might want to talk about this later, but there's something called the brilliant precursor that happens when you have very rapid phase changes at high frequencies. So we're into territory where we're not really sure about what all the, the risks are. Yet we're driving for charging forward with this technology, mm. which to me, this just raises red flag after red flag. Why are we running into this when we don't even understand the potential risks? Uh, a question for Andrew that's come in. Uh, if we can't discuss health concerns in the context of sighting an antenna, are there situations in municipal hearings where we can talk about health impacts. I know it's one of the things that you caution about is let's not talk about health when we're talking about antenna placement. Okay, well, when you say can't talk about health, it depends upon the nature of the discussion and the venue you're before. So what they're referring to is one of the provisions of the Telecommunications Act says that local governments may not regulate based upon environmental concerns, which have been interpreted in many jurisdictions to include health concerns, to the extent that a facility is FCC compliant. Now, what does that mean? What that means is if by, as is commonly done, an applicant submits something to a planning board or ZBA known as an FCC compliance report, they will claim that the once built, the facility will not expose members of the general public to radiation levels which exceed what are known as the general population exposure limits. If they do that, and there's no proof submitted into the record that it won't exceed those limits, the board cannot consider potential adverse impacts, health impacts, as a basis upon which to deny the application. However, the other big concern is the fact that while these limitations exist, they are not actually enforced. Once a facility goes up, the FCC in reality doesn't test these facilities as far as the radiation they're emanating and doesn't require the owners to test them. It's right on their website. And so sophisticated local governments are now adapting co adopting codes which provides for random RF testing so that local governments can at any time without giving notice to the facility owner, have an RF engineer test the radiation limits. If they find the actual radiation levels exceeding the FCC's limits, they can do a number of things. They can find the owner of the facility or even better yet, 
they can schedule a hearing at which they require the owner or operator of the facility to show cause why their permit should not be revoked and the, and the tower ripped down. Um, this began many years ago. Three municipalities in, in California started it. I believe the first cities to do it were the cities of Burbank, Berkeley, and Davies. Um, and I recommend to all my clients that they do it because we know that municipalities are in actuality the constituents first and only line of defense against being exposed to illegally excessive levels of radiation. And by illegally excessive, I mean rating less radiations emissions, which are exceeding the FCC's limits. Nobody is testing these facilities and the wireless industry knows it. So the only way you're gonna protect yourself is to periodically test it. Ken, I think this question may be for you. Do microwave frequencies and pulse modulation generate compression waves, which also impact biological systems beyond arbitrary setback distances and at more subtle levels of exposure? Yeah, you may know who's asking this question. Go ahead. Actually, I'm not sure who is asking the question. Okay. It sounds like the Havana syndrome. There's something called the Frey effect, so that if you have pulsed modulation, pulsed microwave radiation, you can create a, a secondary wave, a compressive wave within the skull. So if you hit the resonant frequency of the skull with the pulsation, you can cause well, the effects that we know about from the Havana syndrome. Does, do people know what that is? It's what our uh, diplomats experienced in Havana and other places. Uh, where they thought they were going crazy, they were hearing noises, and it caused brain damage. So yes, that can happen, and that is one of the concerns when you're radiating all of from all of these sources. There are things that can happen that you really wouldn't anticipate using conventional or what we think we know about radiation today. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's a, it's a concern. There are a lot of things going on. Something else to point out is that 5G doesn't replace anything. It's, it's piggybacked upon 3G, 4G, and it you know, then is what the, provides the data for these systems. But it's, it doesn't replace it. It doesn't get rid of 4G. Uh, so what you have is this now this, uh, this soup, if you will, of radiation that we're being exposed to. And we're not sure how the combination of those frequencies of that, that exposure impacts us humans and the environment. Right. Um, I have another question. Uh, Paul, did you mention that there are frequencies that can be used for wireless that are not harmful? And could you elaborate on that or were you, were you mis, misquoted? So uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, in other words, could you design a signal that would be less biologically active than what is currently in use? And uh, my opinion is yes, you could do that, but uh, you would have after designing it uh, to prove that, you know, with experiments uh, that this works. And so it would take a bit of money to actually demonstrate this in a biological model that would convince everyone that this is worth changing the modulation patterns of all cell phones in the world because some experiment somewhere has uh, demonstrated this but in my opinion it is possible okay um does anyone know the power density of small 5g antennas in residential areas is there a recommended level frank do you happen to know what that level is or is there a standard level Anybody know? I believe it's still the 10 watts per uh, meter squared, mm -hmm. just the FCC limit. Uh, is that, of course, that really hasn't been defined as I know it above six gigahertz. Do you know, Paul? No, I don't know. But essentially, uh, what they're trying to do with this standard, they realize that at higher frequencies, they have more SAR problems and at lower frequencies because the energy is dissipated in a thinner part of the body. So they're trying to change this standard to something like power density, in other words, to increase the standard. So you, we have a situation in which the uh, human tolerance apparently rises as they design new pieces of equipment. Isn't that strange? that your body changes in its properties and its tolerance as industry needs to, uh, or as Frank's managers need to expand their, their sales in the next quarter. <laughs> 
What a coincidence. I want to explain to our viewers here that Dr. Goldberg was unable to stay with us uh, through the entire panel. Uh, there are a lot of questions for her. I promise you I'm going to download all of the chat um, and we will have to schedule another one of these and bring Dr. Goldberg back to ask to answer many of the medical questions you have, uh, because we've got, you know, a, a lot of people who are very concerned about, you know, mold and other things that that can work together with RF radiation to uh, to cause a problem. I have a simple question from somebody who has what they call a dumb flip phone. Is that any safer than the modern smartphones? Anybody? The first generation of phones were analog modulation. They would be uh, fundamentally different. But since you got to uh, TDMA and CDMA, you know, the digital modulations, all uh, cell phones share uh, impulsiveness in their signals. And this impulsiveness is more likely to uh, induce uh, non-thermal effects than the old modulations. So uh, your phone would have to be pretty dumb to be safer. <laughs> Andrew, I have another question for you. This is, this is about the, the FCC decision in the EHT CHD case and whether or not that decision provides any opportunity for um, parents to get small uh, to get uh, antennas removed from schools. I'm not sure which case you're referring to. I thought you were going to ask me about the uh, Portland case. Um, so I'm not no, I'm sure. About I'm talking about the the uh, appeals uh, court of appeals in the federal court of appeals in Washington, which ruled that the FCC's action was arbitrary and capricious and decided. Right. To okay. Keep That's the, yeah. The Children's Health Defense Defense case. So. That case is essentially challenging whether or not the standards deemed safe by the FCC are in fact safe and need to be revisited. And the second, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals reversed, reversed the decision as arbitrary and capricious and said, listen, you got 2000 pages of studies from experts, you have to go back and reconsider that. I think unless something dramatic changes, the battle over what level of RF emissions are deemed safe by the FCC is going to go on for quite some time. Um, as far as putting wireless facilities on schools, there are many things that can be done. Um, because when a school enters a lease to allow a cell tower to go on school property, a school is not acting in a regulatory capacity. It's acting in a proprietary capacity. And that changes everything. Um, some schools have allowed cell towers to go on school buildings. But when they did so, they put a provision in the lease that actually limits the level of radiation that the facility can emit. That was challenged in the Sprint case, and the court upheld the school district's right to enforce its own lease. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with schools is parents aren't made aware of it. Generally, they'll file applications or they'll have hearings to adopt leases in the summer when everybody's on vacation because they don't want the parents to know what's going on. And by the time the parents find out about it, the lease is already signed and it's too late. In most cases, you can kill these things before the lease is signed if you simply look at the constitutional principles of the school. The whole purpose of a school is not merely to provide a learning environment, but to provide a safe learning environment. And so if parents find out about in advance, we've been able to kill them before you ever get to any zoning applications because we induce the board to refuse to enter the lease in the first place. Um, if it's too late and the facility goes up, the best thing to do is to get an RF engineer to randomly test the facility. And if you find the, FC the radiation levels exceeding the FCC's limits, well, all hell breaks loose, let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay, we are coming to the end of our allotted time. Uh, before we go, I wanted to give you some important information about next steps and where you can go for more science or policies. If you're a policymaker or you're an elected official, you can find much more information on that toolkit at our website. The short URL is americans4rt.org and there we have sample codes, code checklists codes from various towns and cities across the country. There's lots of good ideas you can steal from. Uh, if you're a local resident of White Plains, there are a host of actions that you can take to help the city of White Plains adopt and enforce a protective code. Please be in touch with 5G Alert Westchester. Their email address is on the screen. If you're from somewhere else, please either find or found your own group 
You'll find a list of groups from all over the country on the art website. That's americansforrt.org forward slash partners. Uh, and there you'll find uh, also information, if there's not a group in your area, about how to start a group. So our job at ART is to help you do that and to help you become um, good um, advocates in your community. Uh, I want to thank our presenters, uh, Dr. Paul Haru, Mr. Frank Clegg, Dr. Sharon Goldberg, Dr. Kent Chamberlain, and attorney Andrew Campanelli. I also want to thank all of you who attended this evening's presentation. A video of the webinar will be made available tomorrow, God willing. All, all of you who registered for this event will get the link in an email. Uh, on behalf of my friends at 5G Alert Westchester, thank you so much for attending. Thank you, panelists, and good night, everyone.